also want to acknowledge CMAR for welcoming all of us into this beautiful community space. Um, and I also want to acknowledge all of you who took the time out of the family hour to be here today in community. Um, all of us come from near or from far to troubleshoot some very serious, very challenging issues, but the enormity of the number of people who are here today as institutional actors, as people with lived and professional experience, um, I truly believe that the expertise that we need to address these issues is in this room right now. I'm a Beacon Hill girl, uh, and I want to be your new, oh, I also want to acknowledge Commissioner Fred Fellman. <laughs> Council member Teresa Mosquera. <laughs> you know, um, the reason why I'm here as a board commissioner is because um, two things. One is that as a Beacon Hill girl, I know firsthand, as all of you here do, that the Port of Seattle has an impact on every single one of our lives. It impacts our communities, in our economic viability, in our, um, in the quality of life and of our environment. Um, but it's. I also recognize that not all of us have always had access to the opportunities, the good things that the Port of Seattle does generate. And so, um, as when I was elected, I don't think it took over a month. <laughs> before my community members from Beacon Hill sent me a letter. And they said, we have very serious issues facing the Beacon Hill community, and we need the Port of Seattle to seriously consider them and work to address them. And in our response, we acknowledged, you know, we have something within the Port of Seattle to address the issues in South King County to the Highline Forum. We have a mechanism to address the issues impacting the CTAC community from the JAC, but we don't actually have an institutionalized way to address the issues facing Beacon Hill or South Seattle for that matter. But we also know that the flight path goes right over Beacon Hill, and as a historically minority, majority community due to that legacy of redlining. And so what we decided was, we also acknowledge that Beacon Hill is unique in that it faces the compounding impacts, not just from SeaTac Airport and its flight path, but also the flight path and the operations of King County International Airport. And we know that the Port of Seattle, willing as it may be to begin to address some of these issues and these, these disparities and the impacts, cannot do this work alone. To be able to be responsive to the concerns of community members, we have to have a big tent and we have to call people in. So what we committed to do was being a convener. It is over a year later and I am so deeply grateful to all of you who have shown up as solutions to these complex issues. Um, so I, <clears throat> I know that this is um, not a one and done. Like, unfortunately, we're not gonna solve for it tonight. This is the first conversation of many. Um, but uh, please raise your hand if you live, um, if, if you live on Beacon Hill. Please raise your hand if you work on Beacon Hill or um, somebody that in, is in your family lives on Beacon Hill. Please raise your hand if you serve people who live on Beacon Hill. So we have to be cognizant of, not, of who's not in the room, which is another example of how this conversation can only grow from here. Um, I don't have any predetermined outcomes of what's gonna happen from this meeting, but I do know one thing, is that we committed that it be community-centered. So please raise your hand if you are a institutional actor, you are here on behalf of, of, of a government or an airport. Our job today is to be 
subject matter experts, lend our expertise, and to listen. But community is gonna drive this conversation. They're gonna identify some priorities um, and issues. It might be about noise pollution. It might be about air pollution. It might be about economic development and opportunities for businesses, right? It might be about, um, it might be about transportation issues, drage trucks driving through your community members, whatever it is, this, it is your prerogative to name it. Okay, this is your space. Um, thank you all so much for coming with um, open hearts, but most importantly, open ears, because we all have a lot to learn today. Thank you. at Maria and I'm thinking about the, one of the first meetings that I had getting into Seattle City Council office in 2018 was a call about pollution and she reminded me this is not just about the pollution that shows up on your skin on the top of your car that you breathe in every day it's about the noise pollution and the pollution that it causes within your entire body the mental the physical health of our community that's the type of pollution that they brought to our attention that we worked quickly to try to address in the budget to initiate a process. But this issue is so much bigger than what the city of Seattle can tackle alone. It has to be done in partnership and led by community affected, both industry, workers, community members, elders, youth, who all want solutions to making sure that we have a healthy population and a healthy environment and a healthy economy. And that's, I think, the thread that connects us all today. As, as um, Andres was telling me, who was all here, and thank you again for reaching out, and to Nate as well, Nate Caminos. Um, it's great to be here, because I think that the connective tissue that I hear from folks in the room might be totally different hats, might be completely different lived experiences, but the connective issue that I hear is really about health and health for our community, health for our workers, health for our um, economy, and health for our um, eco e e environment. So I'm excited to be here with you. Uh, I also am excited to be here um, in this neighborhood having this conversation, and, and uh, Commissioner Hasegawa has already mentioned the important role that CMAR has played, but it's exciting to be here in this museum, the Chicano Museum, right? Chicano Museum, reminding us that it's not just about race and ethnic identity, it's about political aspirations to change public policy. As a Chicana, my identity is to identify with wanting to create racial justice, economic justice, get at the heart of the issues, the isms that we face. And so it's very exciting, and I think very appropriate that we are in the Chicano Museum to think about the public policy and the type of changes that can be done with the pen through actions that are led and directed by community members. That is para chicanismo, right? That is part of how we make sure that we fulfill a vision of having those who are affected by injustices really lead the path to creating long-lasting public policy changes that right historic wrongs. So none of us are here carrying the burden of those historic wrongs that got us into a situation where yes, our race and our ethnicity does determine how long we live. And where we live in the city and in the county and across this region determines how well we live and the likelihood that we will contract diseases or die earlier. That is the kind of public policies that have been put into place and it's not the public policies that we have to keep there. So I'm thrilled to be part of the conversation and to hear more about how we can fight um, against the issues that we see that are causing harm against communities, especially as we think about um, disproportionate impacts of asthma, disproportionate impacts of um, long-term chronic diseases, and how we can also promote diversity within our industries and greener local economies, fight for that green new development um, investments as part of our ways that we are using COVID to reset uh, what a just and more equitable economy looks like. So whether you're from industry or a longtime advocate, I see um, council of, I should say, Representative Velma Valoria, former Representative Velma Valoria in the room who continues her advocacy within the Filipino community and the Filipino Community Center. We all are coming to this, I think, seeking the same thing, and that is more healthy, 
healthy communities, healthy economy, and we're just policies. So I'm here, as Commissioner Hasekawa mentioned, uh, to be a listener today and to really um, identify where we can advance public policies collectively. And I don't want there to be another five years, right? Maria and I had this conversation five years ago. We shouldn't be having this discussion five years from now still and be in this place. So let's make progress. Let's build on the work that's been done in the past few years. And thank you again for the opportunity to be here, Commissioner, and for all of your time and expertise that you lend so that we can then write those historic Another one is improvement of community engagement as well as the communication of the plan to the community. How they're hearing about it, is it, is it accessible to them? Do they know about it? Um, and a big thing that was focused on was the coordination between both master plans um, and how they're gonna intersect and the communication to the community about both of them together. We also have some specifics about scope three emissions, overlay of flight paths, um, but a lot of our discussions were focused on success, um, and this really came down to community engagement. And we talked a lot about community benefits agreement, having community compensation for people who are sharing their experiences, um, and you know, paying them and have it be during a time when they can actually attend. And as well as having a, having a trusted advocate in the community and building those relationships. Um, Further on from that, we talked about how to have accessible engagement, defining equity, um, and having those people involved earlier in the process. One minute, huh? One minute. But it's very difficult to do that in one minute. Yeah. There's a lot to talk about in here and noise. But one of the key issues, uh, well, one of them was the uh, flight path um, and, and the hours. So it wasn't just um, by passing itself, but also the idea of the airport expansion and, and what does that mean? And then it gets into the question about how do you mitigate uh, with, uh, when it comes to the airport uh, expansion and also the, the flight pass. Um, what's currently being done? What are some of the things that were obviously the, the impact was? Well, the, one of the questions that we just discussed was around uh, not every community, there's some of this has to do with the legislation over. FAA regulations, not everybody, the issues get mitigated the same. There's some barriers or restrictions when it comes to addressing some of the issues. But when it comes to what can be done, a coordinated effort, more inclusive, coordinated effort with the community, court, and, and maybe the court being one of those that take a leadership role in making sure you coordinate with the utilities and other agencies in other cities, when it comes to planning. So it's not just even just a, a, a noise issue or an air pollution, but in climate change, some of the planning efforts that are going on that address those things uh, include uh, uh, the noise in the air from the airport involved in, in including those. A lot of key themes kept popping up um, as we were having a discussion with the groups. Um, so one of the, the key one is really the need to kind of balance um, economic growth and expansion with um, really addressing the you know, environmental issues that has, um, the community has experienced uh, historically and, and still do, uh, currently experiencing. Um, so again, really finding a balance with that. And with that balance, kind of making sure that the, the funding that's made available for these opportunities is reflected and prioritized to really um, mitigating and improving those environmental health hazards and issues in the local community. Um, and another thing that uh, kept popping up was um, great economic prosperity, but making sure that everyone has access to the benefits um, that comes with that growth. Um, that, uh, that includes uh, really um, uh, implementing efforts that mitigates or Re significantly reduces or prevents displacement along with gentrification and making sure that um, there is housing uh, that the, the, the local workers can, can stay in, in their communities so they don't have to travel from afar to, to be able to get, um, get to their jobs. Um, and another key one, I guess, is really the community engagement. Um, really not, I guess, uh, making sure that the community engagement isn't just a checkbox 
but really that uh, there are uh, internal, I guess, process, processes that are improved to make sure that everything is being done to capture, capture input from these local communities and ultimately being reflected in um, projects and everything that comes about uh, through action. Um, you can hear me okay? All right, great, thanks. So uh, just to echo what everyone else is saying, and we just put this up here, and I don't need to uh, read those, if you guys can see that for yourselves. So I just wanna um, just cover some, some quick uh, notes here, like um, and we were discussing how can we work better together, right? So the issues are working in silos, uh, there is not enough collaboration going on, lack of communication with the, the government agencies and the communities, um, there's no accountability uh, within all the different government agencies, FAA, et cetera. Uh, there needs to be more rela relationship building and we need to build trust. Right now, um, everything that's happening on the lack of information, the lack of connectivity is, um, is affecting the trust of the community. So pretty much that, that sums it all up. Thank you to the Point Seattle staff also who, who came um, and, and supported today. And most of all, I want to thank you all, our participants, uh, for showing up. Uh, uh, Auntie Manita, Auntie Velma, and Sheila, uh, can you just raise your hands? Velma, Auntie Velma, raise your hands. Uh, I just wanted to personally thank you for being the impetus and sending a letter um, and saying that we needed to have a targeted and structured conversation around this. and. Um, this, uh, this is just the beginning. Um, and so um, this is partnership, and I think one of my biggest takeaways in sort of roaming around and listening in is that there has to be coordination. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to seeing the culmination of notes and identifying where there's common denominators. Um, and how this is going to move forward. What's up, Auntie Velma? You look like you have something oh, to say. Oh, I just wanted—I just wanted to say it wasn't um, just me that did the letter, but there's like five organizations here. And um, Maria, where are you? Oh, do you want to get up and introduce all the people that initiated the letter? Well, I'm going to ask them to stand up and okay. say <laughs> what the organization is. So I'm representing El Centro de la Raza today. Come on, guys. There are five of us. There's a sixth organization that's joining us called Partners in Change to organize people of color around the airport. So I'm Sheila Brush with Quiet Guys Puget Sound, and thank you for having me. And your organizing is around the airport, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm Brandon. Yeah, our organizing at 350 Seattle is really around climate and health and justice. And with Maria here at Beacon Hill Council. And Velma does King County International yeah. Airport Community Coalition. Department so we're together. Change. We no longer distinguish between underneath the flight path and around the airport. We're together with less than half a million people impacted. And so thank you all so much for the generosity of your time and your expertise and most of all your honesty. Thank you. David, I just wanted to see if maybe we could give Loma a round of applause as well for Commissioner Hasegawa for You know, when you receive a letter like that from the aunties, you jump to action. And this is, uh, as she noted in the beginning, a really exciting night to, to know that this is just the beginning of multiple conversations to come, but action, action, action is what I heard here. Um, I just took a few notes, but the real uh, word that I think I keep hearing is trust. And one of the things that really excites me is I think the trust that's been built at the tables throughout the night, but also the desire to see policies that help instill that trust. And um, I love the idea of having community workforce agreements, community benefit agreements, project labor agreements, local hire agreements. Those are examples of public policies that help us get, uh, give a better sense of the direction that future work will take. That public policy is going to be inclusive of the community that's raised concerns from the beginning. That policy um, that is centered on worker rights and continuing to make sure that people have access to good living wage jobs will be inclusive of not only the community that's currently working in this good living wage 
unionized job sector, but that it will be inclusive of more folks, diverse folks, community that want access to good living wage jobs, and that the entire community has the opportunity to see a healthier outcome for the future of this policy work. So I'm excited about the kernels that have been laid today, and when I hear folks bring up uh, community benefits agreements and project labor agreements, and to know that there's already excitement around those policies helps me see how we can build greater trust and create true um, fundamental change. So thanks for the opportunity to participate with you all tonight, and especially to Commissioner Hasegawa and all the conveners. Incredible notes. Look forward to the next.